Look with me in Luke chapter 22. Going to start reading in verse 31. You will survive the sifting. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. Jesus says in Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, you will strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Don't have time to read all the verses in Luke 22, but if we were to continue reading, we would find that Jesus and the disciples went out into the garden. Three times Jesus prayed, three times he told the disciples to pray with him. Let's pick up reading in verse 46, Luke 22 and verse 46. This is the third time Jesus came back and found the disciples sleeping. This is what he says, Luke 22, 46. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Looking at verse 47. But while Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them, we know from the Gospel of John that that one was Peter, one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the servant's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers and temple guard and elders who had come for him, am I leading an insurrection that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. But Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But Peter denied it. He said, woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw Peter and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the people that you love so much. And for your powerful word. Father, I pray that each one of us would hear a word from the Holy Spirit today. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. Did you ever notice that people do funny things? They say funny things when they are under the pressure of a test. Recently, I came across some funny answers that students wrote down on their tests. The answers weren't right, but they weren't necessarily wrong either. From history class, we have these gems. Question, in what battle did Napoleon die? Now, we, of course, all know that it was the Battle of Waterloo. Eight, uh, nine o'clock service didn't know that. I guess it was too early. But, but one student wrote down instead, what battle did he die in? His last one. Well, it's... It's not wrong. Question, what ended in 1896? Answer, 1895. <laughs> yes, in 1896, 1895 
was definitely over. Being from Philly, this one was especially dear to my heart. Question, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? Answer, at the bottom. From science class, give a brief explanation of what hard water is. Answer, ice. Well, that was brief. Name four heavy metals. Answer, Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax. From a unit on light refraction, prisms, and color. Question, what is your favorite hue? Answer, Jackman. My favorite hue is Hugh Jackman. That was a giveaway question as it was, and someone still managed to lose points on it. And from math class, we have these brilliant deductions. If you have three apples in one hand and four apples in the other, what do you have, class? You have very large hands. That was the answer. Question, how do you change centimeters into meters? Now, you and I might divide by 100, but one student found an even faster shortcut. How do you change centimeters into meters? You simply remove the centa. <laughs> and this one's my favorite. Brian has 50 slices of cake. If he eats 48 slices, what does Brian have now? The answer is diabetes. Brian now has diabetes. I don't think I would be a very good teacher. I, I would be too tempted to give, give points for wit and creativity. People say and do funny things under the pressure of a test. And that was certainly the case with Simon Peter. When Simon Peter was tested, he gave some of the worst answers ever. In fact, he had one of the most epic failures in the Bible. But out of the disgrace of Peter's failed test comes one of the most beautiful testimonies of the enduring love and grace of our good God. I have to be honest with you, I was fully intending on starting a series on the book of Colossians this morning, but about two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit started to, to speak to me this word about the sifting of Simon Peter, and I knew that I had to share this word specifically with you on this Sunday. I have a word from heaven that is appointed for this morning. The word is always good. The word is always fruitful. It's always powerful. But I want to tell you that for somebody in this place today, I have a word in season for you that is anointed this morning to meet your need. And this is the word that God has given me today. You will survive the sifting. This season that you're in, this trial that you're passing through, the, the pressure that you're under right now, the, the persecution perhaps that you're enduring, this painful test, you will survive. And not only will you survive, but when it is over, you will thrive. When it's over, you will be joyful again. When it's over, you will be useful again. You will be productive. You will be effective. You will be fruitful again. You will be successful again. You will be influential for Christ again. I believe that the Holy Spirit is in this place, especially to encourage someone. You will survive the sifting. Looking at the story of Simon Peter, I have three brief encouraging words that I want to share with you from the Holy Spirit. You will survive the sifting. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit. We have some screens that that are coming someday, I don't know when, but they're on a slow boat from China and sometime they'll be here. But in the meantime, we've printed up some sermon outlines for you. Perhaps 
You received a copy on the way in, and you can use that to follow along. You will survive the sifting. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit. The first word is this. You will be sifted. After Jesus shared his last meal with the disciples, the beautiful, tender, intimate atmosphere in the upper room began to rapidly deteriorate. Jesus announced that his betrayer was there at the table and somehow this news quickly developed into an argument over who was closest to Jesus. Rather abruptly, Jesus addresses Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Although Jesus addressed Peter by name, the sifting was not for Peter alone. The sifting was for all of the disciples. The most recent translations have corrected what was unclear in earlier English versions of the Bible. When Jesus said Satan has demanded to sift you, the you is plural. The, the updated NIV translation has it better. Satan has demanded to sift you all like wheat. The Southern Baptist translation says Satan has demanded to sift all y'all. The Bronx version says Satan has demanded to sift all you's people. You see, Satan was on a roll. He successfully influenced Judas to betray Jesus and now he was taking out the whole dirty dozen. Satan wasn't after Peter only, he was after all of Jesus' followers and what was true that night in the upper room is still true today. Beloved, listen, there are words from Jesus here that, that we need to embrace. We need to understand them. We need to hang on to them. In the life of every believer, there is an experience of difficult testing, sifting, if you will, and the one behind it is Satan. Jesus' words here remind us very much of the opening scene in the book of Job. Satan stands before God and he asked permission to test Job. In the same way, Jesus tells us here in Luke twenty-two thirty-one 31, that Satan has petitioned God to test us all. Jesus' actual words here are, Satan has demanded to sift you all. That provokes a lot of troubling questions. Who is Satan that he has the right to demand something from God, and why does God permit it? But, but if we could hold off on the why for just a moment, let's just concentrate first on this simple truth. It is not only for Job, it is not only for Peter, but testing is for us all, and Satan is the instigator of it. A second truth in Jesus' words, Satan's goal in sifting is to strip you of your faith and to strip you of your new identity in Christ. It's interesting that when Jesus announces Satan's plans, he addresses Peter by his old name, Simon. There isn't universal agreement among commentators, but there is a group that traces the meaning of Simon's name to a reed. David Pawson has written a book about the transformation of Peter called the reed and the rock. Reeds, of course, are weak. They're unstable. That they bend this way and that way with every changing wind. That certainly describes the impetuous, impulsive fisherman named Simon before he met Jesus. But along the way, Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, a rock. And as Simon's faith in Christ grew, his inner nature changed and his character grew and matured. 
But now, in the context of Satan's desire, of Satan's plans, Jesus calls him Simon again. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. What does that mean? What is this sifting? Well, sifting is a separation process. Satan's goal was to separate Peter from his faith in Christ. Satan's goal was to separate Peter from his newfound identity in Christ. You're not really Peter. You're just plain old Simon. You're no rock. You're, you're the same person you always were. You're still that same old impetuous man that you were. You're no fisher of men. You're just a smelly old fisherman. Satan's goal in sifting for Peter and for us is to provoke a Christian identity crisis. In the garden, when they asked Jesus to identify himself, Jesus said, I am. But in the courtyard, when they asked Peter to identify himself as being with Jesus, he said, I am not. Satan's goal was to expose Peter and all the rest as disingenuous disciples, as men with fraudulent faith. When I get done sifting you, the world will see there is nothing special about you. There is no real fruit of faith in you. You are just chaff. When I get done sifting you, the world will see you are nothing but a big old hypocrite. Now, how on earth is that encouraging? I said I had three encouraging words to share. How is the news that you will be sifted encouraging? Well, if you're going through sifting, and every believer does, it's encouraging to know that what you're experiencing is normal. It's encouraging to know that this is supposed to happen. Jesus said it would. It's encouraging to know that you haven't done something wrong. It's encouraging to know that God doesn't love you less than someone else. In fact, Hebrews says that the Lord trains those he loves. He, he disciplines them. That doesn't mean correction. It means he trains them up and trains them to be mature. And the way he does it is by bringing them through hardships. It's also encouraging to know that you're not the only one going through it. Others have gone through it. Others are going through it right now, and others yet will go through it. And the ones who went through it made it through. The ones who are going through it are making it. And the ones who have yet to go through it, they will make it, and you are going to be part of helping them make it. You will survive the sifting. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit. Number one, you will be sifted. Number two, Three strikes and you're still in with Jesus. Mm, this is my favorite part right here. I might go glossolalic. Three strikes and you are still in with Jesus. Mm, this is good right here. I preach myself happy. The first service, they were a little sleepy. It's a little warm in here, but you get happy with me, all right? In the upper room... When Jesus announced Satan's plans, Peter made a self-confident boast. He said, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and even to death. But Jesus said, oh, Peter, before the rooster announces daybreak, you will deny me three times. As the night unfolded, the sifting began. And we get a glimpse of some of Satan's strategies. For one thing, Satan sifts us in stealth. After supper, Jesus led the disciples to the Mount of Olives and he began to agonize in prayer. An arrest party led by Judas arrives. And in the heat of the moment, Peter drew his sword and he lopped off the high priest's servant's ear. When Peter was met head on with force, he met force with force. I would suggest to you that Peter wasn't so much in danger of being sifted in that moment. His moment of danger came a little while later when the enemy came at him very subtly through a little teenage girl. 
In the garden, Jesus said, day after day I was in the temple, but you didn't arrest me then in broad daylight. No, this is how you operate. You operate stealthily in the cover of darkness. And beloved, that is precisely how the enemy comes at us. If he came at us head on, immediately we would rise up and we would withstand him. But he comes at us in subtle ways that we don't recognize until we've already stepped right into his trap. What are some of Satan's strategies? Satan sifts us in isolation. The Jewish leaders waited to arrest Jesus until he was away from the big crowds. They arrested Jesus when he was alone with just his closest disciples. And as the night unfolded, Peter became more and more isolated himself. In the garden, the disciples all ran off in every direction. They abandoned Jesus and Peter followed him at a substantial distance. As the trial got underway in the high priest's house, Peter warmed himself by the fire in the courtyard. He was cut off from the support and the fellowship of the other disciples. He was all by himself, completely surrounded by people who oppose Christ. Beloved, can I tell you that our enemy still sifts us in isolation. He waits for occasions when some distance has opened up between us and Jesus. Now, Jesus never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But sometimes we don't follow him as closely as we ought. Sometimes distance of our own making opens up between us and Jesus. Our enemy waits for occasions when we're isolated from our brothers and sisters in Christ and surrounded by people who oppose Christ. Maybe we've just been overly busy and it's kept us away from fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe we've had a health problem that's prevented us from being in fellowship. Maybe we've had an encounter that left a bad taste in our mouth and we've pulled away from the body of Christ. Whatever the reason, it is very dangerous when we are isolated from the body because then we are prime targets for sifting. What are some of Satan's strategies? He sifts us, listen, by energizing people to rattle us. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that Satan energizes people to be his agents. Very interestingly, Paul uses precisely the same words that he uses to describe the influence of the Holy Spirit on believers. The Holy Spirit energizes believers to speak and behave in ways that are holy, in ways that are good and pleasant and lovely to God. Satan energizes people to speak and behave in ways that are evil and malevolent and repugnant to God. Now listen, listen, think about this with me. Peter didn't flinch at the blazing torches and the shimmering blades of steel of the arrest party. He, he didn't flinch at that, but he was completely undone by the softly spoken words of a little teenage girl. What kind of spiritual force was behind her words? Have you ever had a confrontation with someone that just shook you to the very core? Maybe they were just angry at you at a level that really didn't fit the situation. They were just over the top furious with you. Or maybe they never raised their voices at all, but, but their words belittled you in, in a way that you just couldn't shake off. Afterwards, all the wind was just out of your sails. Some years ago, Denise and I developed a code word for such demonically inspired attacks. If you've been around a while, you know it. We call it a wacko jacko attacko. If I had another life to live, Dom, I would write headlines for the New York Post. That would be one of my dream jobs. Several years ago, Michael Jackson was visiting in New York City and a crazed fan broke through the lines and took, took a swing at him. 
The next day, the post ran the headline, Wacko, Jacko, Attacko, and it just kind of stuck with us. You might find yourself in a situation where someone comes at you in a way that is just over the top ferocious. They come at you in a way that is just over the top venomous and it shakes you up inside. You have just had a wacko jacko attacko. Sitting by the fire in the high priest's courtyard, Peter wasn't merely made out by a little slave girl. It's likely that she hardly ever even left that house. He was the victim of a wacko jacko attacko. We know from the other gospel accounts that she was the one who instigated the others to keep coming back to him and saying, you know him, you know him, you know him. What are some of Satan's strategies? He sifts us by eclipsing our faith with fear. Listen to this. In the upper room, Jesus said, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. The word fail is the word eclipse. I have prayed for you that your faith may not be eclipsed. I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't go dark. I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't get blotted out. In light of Peter's epic failure, one might wonder, was Jesus' prayer really effective? Because for a few hours in the middle of the night, Peter's faith was eclipsed by fear. Can I tell you, beloved, that 2,000 years later, Satan still uses the strategy of fear. His sifter might be a relationship crisis. Or it might be a crisis in the life of someone that we love. His sifter might be an employment crisis. It might be a financial crisis. His sifter might be a health crisis. His sifter might be a trauma that you have undergone or a loss that you have incurred. Satan was successful in making Peter panic. And in the midst of his panic, Peter forgot everything. In the midst of his panic, he, he forgot how to apply the words of Jesus to his crisis. He forgot that Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, turn the other cheek. Lord, should we draw our swords? Of course not, dummy. In his panic, he forgot what, that Jesus said, confess me before men and deny yourself. He forgot that Jesus said, don't try to save your life. Be willing to risk losing it for my sake. For a few dark hours, Peter forgot that Jesus was still in control. He forgot that everything was happening just as Jesus had said it would. For a few dark hours, the rock was a reed again. For a few dark hours, Peter did everything pretty much opposite the way a disciple of Christ was supposed to do things. I do not know the man. I am not one of his. I told you, I don't know him. cock a doodle do. Simon was sifted. Fear had eclipsed his faith. But beloved, listen to me this morning. Everybody look at me. Look, 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 look right here. It wasn't a total eclipse. Was his faith darkened for a moment? Yeah. But it didn't disappear completely. What follows is one of the most beautiful restoration stories in the entire Bible and a message of hope for you and for me. Peter had three strikes against him, but he wasn't out. He was still in with Jesus. There were three heavenly resources that helped Peter survive the sifting, and they will help us survive as well. First of all, Jesus' personal intercession. Go back with me to the upper room for one moment. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, 
Satan has demanded to sift you all like wheat. The you is plural. But then Jesus said, I have prayed. Listen, listen, listen. Everybody look at me. He has demanded to sift you all like wheat. But then Jesus said, I have prayed for you, singular. I have prayed for you personally that your faith will not be eclipsed. <laughs> Beloved, look at me, please, look at me. Do you realize what that means? What that means is that Jesus is praying highly personalized prayers of intercession for each one of us who belong to him. Now that Jesus has ascended to heaven, the Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the Father and that he is constantly making intercession for us. But listen, Jesus isn't merely praying nice little generalized blanket prayers Father, bless them all. Father, help them all. Father, keep them all. No, what Jesus is telling us is that he is praying for each one of us by name. <laughs> Satan has demanded to sift you all, but I am praying for you, Peter. I am praying for you, Glenn, I am praying for you, Brian. I'm praying for you, Terry. I'm praying for you, Jonathan. I'm praying for you, Bill. I am praying for you personally. <laughs> Jesus is praying for us specifically that the Father will supply exactly what we need at the very moment that we need it. He's praying for us. This is my favorite part. I love this. Listen, listen. Jesus is praying for us in agreement with God's will, in agreement with God's future plans for us that we don't even know about yet. In the upper room, Jesus knew that for a few dark hours, Peter's faith would be eclipsed by fear. But he also knew that Peter would repent and afterwards, Peter would go on to be the leader of the twelve and the founding father of the church. When Jesus spoke about Satan's schemes, he called him Simon. But when Jesus spoke about his prayers and God's future plans, he called him Peter. Beloved, listen, if you are in Satan's sifter right now, receive a word of encouragement from the Holy Spirit. Jesus is praying personally for you. He's praying for your needs with perfect specificity and in totality. He is praying for you in agreement with God's future plans for you that are so great. The Bible says you haven't even imagined what God has planned. Thank you for that golf clap. And beloved, here's something that we can do that Peter didn't do. We can pray in agreement with Jesus' personalized prayers for us. In the garden, three times, Jesus said, guys, pray with me so that you won't fall into temptation. Three times, the disciples fell asleep. They were exhausted. Jesus understood. He knew. He, he knew the, the human struggle. But one has to wonder what the outcome might have been if they had stayed awake and prayed with Jesus. You know, we don't have to make that same mistake. When we're being sifted, we can pray in agreement with Jesus' personal prayers for us. And the way we do that is by praying in the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 that when we pray in the Spirit, when we pray in tongues, when we pray using the heavenly language that God has given us to pray, the Holy Spirit leads us to pray in agreement with God's will for us. 
So listen, when we're in the sifter, we can get on our knees, we can go before the face of God, we can pray with our understanding, and we can pray in our spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead us to pray in agreement with the prayers that our great intercessor, intercessor our pray, is praying for us in heaven. That's good right there. That's so good, Nick's going to come back and teach you. I, already, I texted him between services. Pastor Nick going to come back and teach you about that another time. Three heavenly resources that help us survive the sifting. Jesus' personal intercession for us. Number two, Jesus' loving gaze. Everyone listen to this. As soon as the rooster crowed, Jesus came into Peter's view. We know from the other Gospels that they, they shuffled Jesus back and forth that whole night. And probably just at that moment, when Peter denied Jesus the third time and the rooster crowed, probably just at that moment they led Jesus through the courtyard, taking him to another stage, another phase of his trial. And Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. That word look, it's a special word. It means to look at someone with special interests. It means to look at them with care, to look at them with concern, to look at them with compassion. Listen, that word look, when Jesus looked at Peter, it means he looked at him with a loving gaze. There's one other time in the Gospels that it specifically says Jesus looked at Peter this way. It's in John 1, verse 42. It was the very first time that Jesus saw Peter. It says in John 1, 42, that Jesus looked at Simon with that same loving gaze, and he saw Simon's future. He told him, you are a reed, but you will be a rock. Beloved, listen, if you don't hear anything else today, if you don't hear anything else, please hear what I'm about to say. Hear this. After a night of epic failure, after a night when Peter's faith was eclipsed by fear, after a night of denial and disgrace, Jesus looked at Peter with the same loving gaze as the first time they met. Jesus looked at Peter and he saw a man that still had a future of fruitfulness and effectiveness for Christ. Jesus looked at Peter and he saw a man that still had a ministry ahead of him. After three strikes, Peter was still in with Jesus. Jesus' love for Peter was unchanged. And his love for you is unchanged. That loving gaze snapped Peter out of his panic. That loving gaze of Jesus. The Bible says, Luke says, that gaze, that look from Jesus, it caused Peter to remember Jesus' words. It, it, it caused Peter to remember his faith. It caused Peter, it awakened, it, it, it snapped Peter out of the fog that he was in and it caused life to, to begin bubbling up inside of him again. It, it caused him to remember all the good promises Jesus had made. Beloved, I do not know who this is for, but I had to preach this message today. I believe that there is someone here. Either you are in the sifter now or, or you went through the sifter and you messed up. And in the sifter, perhaps you panicked. Maybe you forgot the words of Jesus. Maybe you forgot to apply his words to your situation. In the sifter, maybe your faith was eclipsed by fear. In the sifter, maybe you acted in a way that was precisely the opposite of the way a disciple is supposed to act. Maybe you acted in a way that denied Jesus. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is in this church this morning to assure you that Jesus has his eyes fixed on you in a loving gaze.
We can't look across the courtyard and see Jesus, but the Holy Spirit inside of us, he assures us that Jesus is looking at us. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is in this house Maybe you've had an epic failure in your life over the last few years. I don't know what the situation is, but Jesus is looking at you this morning and he's looking at you the very same way that he first laid his eyes on you. He's looking on you and he still sees a man. He still sees a woman that has a future of fruitfulness and effectiveness for Christ. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. Listen, listen, someone needs to hear this word specifically. Jesus is looking at you and he sees someone who still has a future ministry. The Holy Spirit is here to rekindle faith in your spirit. Be encouraged. Look at me. In the name of Jesus, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Jesus is looking at you. Three heavenly resources that help us survive the sifting. Jesus' personal intercession. Jesus' loving gaze. And third, Jesus' forgiveness when we repent. In the Gospels, there is an intentional side-by-side comparison of Judas and Peter. In fact, the stories of Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial, they are intertwined with one another. Don't have time to to, to unpack it all with you, but suffice to to say what made the difference was the different responses to Jesus. Judas tried to go back to the high priest and fix things himself. He tried to take matters into his own hands and put right what he had done, but Peter went out and wept bitterly. And we know from Jesus' words in the upper room that these were tears of repentance. Jesus said, I have prayed for you, Peter, and afterwards you will turn back. That word turn back, it is the most commonly used word in the New Testament for repentance. Judas tried to vindicate himself, but Peter simply threw himself on the loving mercy of Jesus. And Jesus forgave him. Beloved, if our faith has faltered in Satan's sifter, that's precisely what we need to do. John says, my little children, I write to you so that you might not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous one. And if we confess our sins to Jesus, he was faithful and just. He will do what? He will, he'll do what? He'll, oh, come on. Does anybody know what the Bible says? If we confess our sins, he will be faithful and just to do what? I'm not going to finish the sermon until you say it. He will do what? Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. Faltering in sin, it is a big deal. But if we stumble while we're in the sifter, there is a remedy for our sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You will survive the sifting. Three encouraging words from the Holy Spirit. Number one, you will be sifted. Number two, three strikes and you are still in with Jesus. Finally this, after your sifting, you will strengthen others. Don't have time to explore why God allows Satan to sift us, but suffice to say that what Satan means for our destruction, God turns and he uses for our good and for his glory. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift all y'all like wheat, but I have prayed for you specifically. I have prayed for you personally that your faith might not be eclipsed. And after you have repented, you will strengthen others. 
Why does God allow us to endure sifting? I can't answer everything, but I can tell you this. After sifting, we are much less reliant on ourselves and we are much more reliant on God. In the sifter, Satan tried to separate Simon from his faith. He tried to separate Simon from his new identity in Christ, but Jesus let Simon go through the sifter. I want you to notice with me, Jesus didn't pray that God would spare Simon from the sifter. Jesus prayed that God would sustain Simon's faith through the sifter. Jesus used Satan's sifter to separate Peter from his old self-reliance. In the sifter, Jesus brought the man Simon to the end of himself. In the sifter, Jesus allowed strong Simon to be overpowered for just a little while. You see, Satan's plan was to strip Simon of Peter. But Jesus took that and he turned it and he used it to strip Peter of Simon. After the sifter... God will use you to strengthen others. Why does God allow us to endure sifting? I can't tell you everything, but I can tell you that after your sifting, you will be more compassionate with others who are struggling. Can you imagine how impossible Peter would have been to live with if he hadn't been humbled in the sifter? self-reliant, proud, old Peter. If he had never been humbled, imagine what a horrible pastor he would have been. How impatient he would have been. How harsh with people when they were faltering and fumbling and when they were going through problems. If he had never been humbled by the sifter, he would have said, come on guys, I did it. Why can't you did it? But no, he had been humbled. He was a humble bumble. The Bible says that Jesus is such an effective intercessor for us because he was tempted in every way like we are. Now, Jesus never sinned, but Jesus is a compassionate intercessor because he has felt our pain in the same way Peter was a better pastor and leader of the church because he had suffered and even stumbled in Satan's sifter. Why does God allow us to endure suffering? I can't tell you everything, but I can tell you this. After sifting, you will have a reservoir from the Holy Spirit that you can minister to others when they're suffering. Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the outcome of suffering, and he said, in the midst of our suffering, we have received comfort from the Holy Spirit. In the midst of our suffering, we have received peace that passes understanding. In the midst of suffering, we have received divine love for our enemies. In the midst of suffering, we have received such strength from the Lord. And Paul says that now that that reservoir, the, all that we received, all that comfort we received, all that strength we received, it's a reservoir inside of us. And now we minister it to you in your suffering. You know, Peter did go on to strengthen others. He strengthened the other disciples. He strengthened the first group of believers in Jerusalem. He strengthened the first Gentile believers in Caesarea Philippi. He strengthened the churches in Syria and Turkey and Greece and in Rome. At 30 years after that horrible night, he wrote some of the most comforting words in the New Testament about suffering. He wrote, I know that you've had to endure trials for a little while, but he said, rejoice in this. These have come to try your faith, which is far more valuable than gold, so that in the end, it will result in praise, glory, and honor to God when Jesus Christ comes again. You know, Peter has been strengthening the church for 2,000 years. By his example and by the words he wrote in the New Testament, he's still strengthening us today. After your sifting, you will strengthen others. Beloved, receive a word from the Holy Spirit this morning. You will survive the sifting. In Jesus' name.
Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place today?